The Raish represents the Rasha, the bad person. The Rasha, bad person or wicked person even. But the first thing to note is its proximity to the Kuf, the letter Kuf, which stands for Kadosh or Holiness. All of the letters face to the left, but with one exception, the Kuf. The Kuf faces to the right. And when you consider that this represents holiness, the Holy One himself, God himself, it provides an illustration of God averting his gaze away from the bad person. Even though God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, Exodus 34, 6, he cannot look upon evil. It's not good theology to sing about God, quote, kissing a guilty world in love, unquote. And it's sentimental, something that is never, ever found in heaven. He could no more kiss a guilty world than he could hold shares in a casino. No, God died for a guilty world, and it is now for that guilty world to kiss the son lest he be angry. Psalm 2 verse 12. There should be no place for maudlin thinking in the church. Its message is too real for that. And it better be more real than that, because the world is becoming more evil and lawless by the day. Our message must be as robust as Jesus at Calvary. All the letters contain their own message, but they also stand together and speak to one another, as it were. The illustration we just looked at is a perfect example of that. Now, in recent years, there was a proposal made that in order to make the learning of Hebrew easier for Israeli children, the letters should be rearranged. But thankfully, this was firmly resisted because the religious authorities understood that the order of the letters is as sacred as the letters themselves. They contain valuable messages. Now let's return to our two companion letters, the Raish and the Kuf. The Raish is the wicked person or the sinner, and the Kuf is the Holy One, is God himself. The repentant sinner then, realizing his or her need, turns hopefully to God for forgiveness and help. The sages drew attention to this little gap here in the top of the kuf, this tiny gap. They saw it as a window or a doorway into God's presence. They taught that God has made it easy for the sinner to turn to him. He enters in through this gap. This then, this gap, represents the torn curtain, that barrier, which hung in the temple separating God from man, even from the priests. Significantly, the curtain was torn in two the very moment Jesus died on the cross. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Matthew 27 verse 51. Note that it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. You see, it was torn by God himself. Now, the curtain was as high as the average two-storey house, 30 feet or 10 metres. And through this gap, many thousands of people have passed from death to life, from sin to holiness, and all with God's approval. As Isaiah said, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Why did God do that? To open up a way into his presence. Jesus said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me or through me. John 14 verse 6. There were other miracles that occurred at the time of Jesus' death. Listen to this astonishing quotation from the first century Jewish historian Josephus. Quote, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, I'd forgotten it took so many men, 
and rested upon a basis armed with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor which was there made of one entire stone it was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour now that sixth hour was the very hour that jesus died quote again he goes on to say now those that kept watch in the temple came thereupon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it who then came up thither and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again this also appeared to the vulgar the common people to be a very happy prodigy as if god did thereby open them the gates of happiness how often have the common or so-called vulgar people proved right the quote goes on but the men of learning understood it that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies so these publicly declared that this signal foreshowed the desolation that was coming upon them it's found in book four of josephus's history both the common people and the authorities were correct but to return to the race now let's presume that the sinner took advantage of god's gracious invitation and entered through the torn veil of jesus's death and resurrection by admitting his sin repenting and putting his trust in jesus does he now cease to grow to develop does he retreat so to speak into his newfound relationship with god does he hide in here so to speak and become a recluse no he has a private and secluded relationship with god yes but he's been equipped to live life to the full to a level he has never known before and the sky is the limit jesus said he's been given a good measure pressed down and shaken together luke 6 38 he's been given life in all its fullness john 10 10. with his relationship to god now secure he faces life he faces the next letter in the aleph bait let me put it on here we can and you'll see the relationship between these letters so now we've got kuf resh shin the resh stands between the kuf and the shin and the shin is a giant letter it represents power and victory notice the shape of the shin it's flames of fire or a field full of grain maybe waving in the wind maybe it's a magnificent tree that you see or maybe a fountain all of these beautiful things aspire upwards they defy gravity the sinner forgiven of his sins he doesn't retreat he discovers a life that defies gravity now what do i mean i mean that whilst he is subject to the same troubles and difficulties as everyone else he is able to perform the miracle of benefiting from his troubles paul put it best in romans chapter 8 said this what shall separate us from the love of christ you see that's what the forgiven sinner is really concerned about his newfound love for jesus and he knows that nothing can take that away from him with the result that he lives a miracle every day he performs a miracle through his connection to jesus he sings if you like through his troubles the same way king david sang through his troubles so whether it's tribulation distress persecution famine nakedness peril or sword he is more than a conqueror that's from romans chapter 8 how is he a conqueror through him who loves us hallelujah you see the natural laws say that we should be depressed by famine and worried sick by the threat of danger and the loss of our lives but the law of the spirit of life that the forgiven sinner has received gives him the power to defy the natural laws this new law the law of the spirit of life the spirit of christ himself is much more powerful than any other law and that's why we can say that the race defies gravity what pushes them down 
raises us up higher. The flames of the shin are in our hearts, fed constantly by the oil of the Holy Spirit. And let's make sure that we receive that rejuvenating oil daily. Lord, renew us daily by thy Holy Spirit. One final thought. Who is the sinner? We may think of the, the immoral, the corrupt, the, the liars and the cheats. And so they are the sinners. But Jesus had a very surprising definition. He said this. He said that the Holy Spirit reproves the world of sin because they believe not on me, Jesus. John 16, verse 8 following. It's a very great sin, the sin of disbelieving in Jesus. And it's something that we have the power to rectify. We can choose to believe in his word. We can choose to follow him. Greater than all our sins is the blood of Jesus. Well, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. First Timothy 2.5. The way into holiness and into life is open for the repentant sinner.